Today's lecture will be presented by Rebecca Cardinal Sockbeeson. Ms. Sockbeeson is a member of the Penobscot Indian Nation and the eighth child of Elizabeth Sockbeeson clan. Like Ms. Loring, Ms. Sockbeeson is the aunt of 27 Wapanakis. She's also the mother of three children and the wife of Reg Cardinal family from the Alexis Nakota Sioux First Nation in Alberta. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at the University of Maine with a formal concentration in women's studies with an emphasis on indigenous women. Her master's in education came from Harvard University where she had a concentration in American Indian education. She's now a doctoral candidate in the Indigenous Peoples Education Program, Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Alberta, Canada. She's come a long way to be with us today. And like her aunt Donna Loring, Ms. Sockbeeson has committed herself to serving her community, having, for example, developed the first center for racially, ethnically underrepresented students at the University of Southern Maine, and organizing the Wapanaki Studies Institute for Teacher Development at the University of Maine, in compliance with the Wapanaki History and Culture Law. She has broad knowledge and deep experience related to issues of indigenous education, and we are privileged to have her as our speaker today. Her talk is entitled, Red Hope, Weaving Wapanaki Policy Toward Decolonization. So please help me give a warm welcome to Rebecca Sockbeeson. Thank you, Jennifer. That's really generous. Um, I want to first thank um, the folks that made this possible. And um, without these, this sort of work, um, our invisibility as Native people, you know, continues. So it's like making these events possible, the donation that Donna Loring has made increases the visibility of Maine Indian people, and we need lots more of that. Um, so with that, I want to give uh, my deepest appreciation to Callie Gurley and Jennifer Tuttle of Maine Women's Writers Collection, uh, Donna Gasper of Multicultural Affairs and Diversity Programs, and the UNE Department of Education. I also want to thank my family who's traveled here from up north in central Maine. Um, their support and prayers and guidance make all of this work possible. Um, I'd, I'd like to move toward what I didn't mean to have up here, but that's okay because I'm going to go ahead and read this. I constructed this um, for my aunt, and I'd, I'd like to share it with you and, and read it to you. Um, before I do that, I need to cite where I first learned about blood memory. Um, late Dr. Eunice Bauman Nelson, um, which was the first Penobscot woman to earn her PhD um, in Maine, uh, explained to me in my mother's office, uh, she had been visiting my mom. My mother worked for the tribal government, Penobscot Indian Nation, for several, for numerous years. Um, and when I was a little girl, I remember late uh, Eunice explaining to me that who, I remember her putting her, you know, her hand out and showing me her veins. And she had explained to me that who we are is in our blood. And we carry that and we carry, so she, I remember her saying, so that can never be taken away because that runs through our veins. You know, our identity runs in our veins and it's in our DNA. And I later came, as I've engaged more with indigenous scholarship and traditional indigenous knowledge holders, um, blood memory is a very um, prominent theory amongst traditional indigenous um, thinkers um, and healers and knowledge, um, traditional knowledge holders. So with that, um, I wrote this sort of honor song um, for my aunt or an ode or a poem. Um, I don't know what, what it would be technically labeled, but it comes right from my heart. The memory in our blood, an honor song for Donna Loring, a true dignitary, honor and dignity permeate from her. My auntie, my mother's little sister, who she's sitting next to right now. I look at her and I see the eyes and strength of my mother. I feel the soul of our grandmothers in her. It's good that I put it up here because here I am already crying. Um, you can follow me here. 
<clears throat> she carries both the spirit of our Wabanaki grandmothers and grandfathers, a modern day warrior. For many close to her, she is their rock, my mountain. Dadadin or Katadin is grandfather in our language. The blood of our ancestors that struggled, suffered so much for us to be here today runs through our veins. That blood has distinct memory. The memory in Donna's blood gave us in the shadow of the eagle to read. The memory in her blood has driven legislation closer towards social and political change for our people. Bearing her soul and mind with her writing and leadership to make a difference. The memory in Donna's blood gave us today to celebrate and to be hopeful. I admire her sense of protection, calm and responsive nature, her, her humanity and integrity. Perhaps the most stubborn person I know, other than myself, my mother, sister, nieces and daughter. Better yet unyielding for what she and we believe are just and right. The memory in our blood gives us survival. Wuli wani auntie. So with that, we've in, I've invited my nieces to come here and sing an honor song for her. This honor song that I want to sing for her is, um, is called Red Sky. And Red Sky um, comes from uh, Sibayak, Maine. And I believe it's one of Barbara Paul's songs. And um, I think about Red Sky. The young people love to sing the song Red Sky. And when I think about Red Sky, I think about hope. And um, because for many of us, you know, a red sky means a brighter tomorrow. And so um, with that, if you're able to, please join us and stand. Um, and I want my auntie to come up here next to me. I've, I've had my, one of my aunts out west um, prepare this ribbon shirt for her. And you know, this is a really special ribbon shirt. My auntie was explaining to me out there, um, Doreen Alexis, that um, she was saying that red is like really, a, it's like a power color, right? And, and I, and she knew that my aunt would wear this really well. So, <laughs> so with that, I, I give her this gift. And it's also her birthday, so happy birthday to her. Next up to you. So girls, you come up here and join me. This is um, Mullian Dana, the first daughter of Barry and Julia, Barry Dana and Julia Sock Beeson. And Stephanie Sock Beeson, the daughter of um, Albert, my brother Albert, and Dorothy Sock Beeson, um, and her baby Layla, and Ethan. And you know what? You can take, you can camera this. This is okay. This is part of our history.
bear with me a moment. Okay, here I am. Okay, here I am. Okay. So, uh, a jibonog, jibonog in our language um, means east, but it also has that, um, is also a concept of hope. Um, it, it's also what I, uh, what I name my third baby, um, and we call him G. So we think Wabanaki policy toward decolonization has much to do uh, with Donna Loring. And um, I want to I first go through a few of these slides, and, uh, but I want to start out talking about some stories. Um, th these here are our grandmothers. Um, the one on the left is Elizabeth Andrews. So Elizabeth Andrews would be my great, my great grandma and my mother's grandma. So my mother and Donna's grandmother is Elizabeth Andrews. Um, she, um, when I look at her, and I didn't know her, um, she reminds me, and when I look into these pictures, which is the only reference point that I have of her, um, she looks very determined. <laughs> um, what I want to talk about and what, I, what I've been starting to try to make sense of, when I first started my academic research um, as a doctoral student, they engaged quite a bit with me in having to know the different paradigms and the different academic theorists, and particularly to understand these two root words um, in the academy, which drive a lot of the theory and research. Um, which is this, these two concepts called epistemology and ontology. And uh, up until maybe just two years ago, I could never really understand the difference between the two. And so I want to share with you what that means to Wabanaki people and what does epistemology and ontology mean to my Penobscot and Sioux family. Um, and I'll, I'll share you a story about that. Um, my children love to hear, when, when I left them, I, it's only the second time I've ever left them, they were really interested, as I laid in bed with them the night before I flew here, um, they wanted to know how uh, we met, how my husband and I met. And they loved this story, and they asked me to retell the story. And as I you know, shared with them how we met, they giggled, and like they usually do. And um, I was struck by how interested they always are to hear about how they came to be. And I think that many of us are like that. We like to know how did you meet? How did you come together? And in so many ways, it, it's like, how did I come to be here? How am I here? And my children also love to hear, my, my son just turned seven, and as we drove to the party store to pick up his balloons, he wanted to hear his birth story. And so, you know, I went through the whole, and I just love telling. As a mother, I love to tell the story of how he came into this world. And so, uh, and he listened with such intensity about how he came to be. And um, so I share that with you because I, I align that, and that is at the foundation of what epistemology is, the ways of being in the world. What are our epistemological foundations? And as I've engaged with um, what is new to the academy, indigenous research methodology, but ancient to our people, um, as I've engaged with indigenous research methodology, it's been intrinsic in unpacking this and articulating it to come inward and engage with my own epistemology and the epistemology of Wabanaki people. So the ways of being in the world, which is really that layer underneath, like we understand what worldview is. It's like, oh, well, this is how people see things. And it's important to get their perspective on it. But it's almost like, Epistemology is that layer underneath that it's like, how, how are these people in the world? How are we in the world? What is our way of being? And what is our way of knowing in the world? And I think that, and how is that relevant? You know, I, I mean, I, before I came t to be a scholar, um, I really was an activist. So that, you know, uh, an indigenous activist, a feminist activist, and that in has influenced and informed my work tremendously. So as I do
do this writing, like I just have my first academic publication, which is a totally different form of writing, right? Um, and as I engage in this type of writing, I need to continue to remind myself of how is this relevant to my people? How is it gonna benefit my people? How is my research going to make an impact upon my people? And how is this relevant to my family? And so um, I do believe that epistemology matters. Epistemology matters a tremendous amount. Um, and for Wapanaki people, our epistemology has been grossly disrupted. And so I want to start to, you know, just give you some information here. So this proclamation of 1857 was the first era of um, US, uh, U.S. policy against um, our people. And this, you know, you hear people refer to physical genocide, cultural genocide. I firmly believe that they are very much interconnected, almost so much that I'm, I'm reluctant to even use the, the, um, the adjective in front of the word genocide because physical and cultural genocide are so incredibly interconnected and reliant upon one another that it's genocide. So our peoples in Maine have survived one of the largest acts of genocide the world has ever known. That's about 97% depletion, original population depletion. And much of that work is cited in Russell Thornton's The Native American Holocaust. Russell Thornton is a demographic anthropologist and a native person that that, that particular text has um, made a real impact in many of, in in many of our works as indigenous scholars um, and scholars committed to heightening um, awareness and social political change for indigenous populations. So this document is, um, is enlarged and put in our tribal offices. And if you can see, I can take this away. Um, if you can, s you might not be able to see from where you're sitting, but it says for every male Penobscot Indian above the age of 12 years that shall be taken within the time afford and brought to before, which is Spencer Phipps, 50 pounds. For every scalp of a male Indian above the age of 12, above the age of 12, 40 pounds. For every female Penobscot Indian and brought in, like a live female Penobscot Indian, and for every, every male Indian prisoner under the age of 12, you know, slightly less money, 25 pounds. And then for the scalp of the female Indian and the male Indian under the age of 12, um, in evidence of their being killed, 20 pounds, so slightly less. So children, you know, still e even back here had less power in society. So um, this document is, you know, in Maine we had over 20 Wabanaki tribes today because of bounties like this, we have only four. And these were all along the eastern seaboard. So, um, you know, when we talk about genocide, and this is subjugated knowledge, like people don't know about this. And these documents were hard to find, too. But they're, you know, like I said, they're pretty well known amongst us, I think. Um, but probably not even. And that's really what LD291 will continue to bring us, the legislation uh, that Donna sponsored and wrote um, that is the mandate to teach Wabanaki history and culture. And um, this, is, this is significant. This is a significant document that needs to be unpacked and everyone needs to know about this document. So um, what's, what's interesting about this document, the first time that I really made a connection to it was when I visited, uh, Mary Bassett is um, an elder from Sibayak and um, she had shared with a group that she started out her talk with this, with this group by saying, we're not supposed to be here. And I remember thinking, what is she talking about? We were not supposed to be here. And then she went on to explain that it was the intention, like even for me to be standing here and for us to be honoring my aunt is saying that, you know, the, the genocide isn't complete and it wasn't totally su successful, but there was an intention for us to not be here. So um, that's really powerful um, to really engage with. So with that, I, I'm gonna go into another story. Um, 
this, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, I'll go back to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this right now. I'm trying to be really conscious of the time. Okay, so um, Adana introduced um, LD291, um, the mandate to teach Wabanaki history and culture. And I'm engaging with narratives. I interviewed her for part, for part of my dissertation. I've interviewed her, and I'm engaging with her policy story um, on this. And um, as she, I've been listening to that narrative because I'm in the analysis stages of, of writing my dissertation. And <coughs> you know, she's aware of the story that I'm about to tell you, but um, one of the things that I picked up on that she said in the interview was that, and something that another elder has talked about um, in, my, in my collection of narratives, is that it really took Native people to look after Native people. And when I asked Donna, what is the weakness in the, in the LD-291? And she said that it's really like people, until they really see how it's going to profit them, they're going to have a hard time, and it's, they're not really going to totally engage with this. Because unless it's like for their own profit, both either financially or in some other human resource, it's not going to be, it's not going to be taken seriously enough. And I think up until this point, we've seen that. Um, I believe that there, well, I know that there's a, a college of education here at the University of New England. I know that the University of Maine system has uh, faculties of education throughout it. And what this is, what I hope my presentation is a call for and an urge to engage more com in a more compulsory way with LD291. And I want to share this story because I think it helps to contextualize the urgency. Um, when my daughter was five years old, she was um, at a school in kindergarten and had come home to me with, you know, all of these, um, you know, treasures of keepsakes that she was, cre you know, receiving and creating in kindergarten. And as I was going through the keepsakes, I found this card. And as a kindergartner, she had been mentored by a fourth grader who was teaching her reading with her. Reading Buddies is, this, is the program that it's often referred to. And she received this card. And, um, oh, you know what? I'm cut off here. The bottom of the screen is cut off. But let's see if the next slide. The fellow wrote this. <coughs> the fellow wrote this um, thank you card. And this is the front of the card. And then this is the inside. So the inside is like this. And I, I asked her, what is this? Because clearly, you know, these peach-colored folks are bombing these dark-colored folks with these bows. And these folks are definitely losing um, and getting killed. Um, and I, I knew immediately what this, what this was celebrating. And I asked her, what's going on here, Julia? She said, well, they're playing this game at recess called Kill the Indians. Um, but mama, I don't play it uh, because I'm a real Indian and I don't want to kill Indians. And it was the first graders that were the pirates and the kindergartners were the Indians. And um, she, you know, I was, I was speechless. And I had said to her, well, what, what is going on, Julia? I, I just couldn't, I was struck. And she said, I don't know, mama, why do they want to kill us? She was including herself in this. I think it's because they don't know enough about us. And um, I didn't have much to say, unfortunately. Um, and we've talked you know, quite a bit about it since then. But it's, it's interesting, too, because a niece, one of my nieces had said, well, it's good. In so many ways, it's good that she knows she's Indian. You know, and she's including herself like she knows who she is. Because being the only Native child in a predominantly white school, she may also not even affiliate with that, or she might reject that after such a game. So I, um, I immediately went into the, uh, and talked with the headmaster, and the response that I got from the school was, well, they are a nice family. And, you know, um, I heard about what kind people they were, which was not what I was questioning at all. Um, but I wanted some sort of immediate anti-racist policy. 
and at the time, to be implemented, and at the time, I was sitting on this commission for LD 291, the state mandate to teach Wabanaki history and culture, and the commission was grappling with and debating over whether or not to teach about racism, genocide, and oppression. And the commission is comprised of um, Wabanaki selected, like tribal uh, chief and council selected re representatives, and um, university folks, and state education folks. And, um, and we, were, we were grappling with, and particularly the teachers that sat on the commission were worried that if we started trying to teach about racism and genocide and the truth and our reality, then um, we might lose people. They won't want to implement it. They won't want to engage with it, which is a real concern, right? And so out of the sky, this is happening simultaneously. You know, my, I think within the next few days, I had a commission meeting. And much of this helped to shift that. And because really the language in the law addresses Wabanaki history and culture. And this game, which is not exclusive to my daughter's experience, a lot of us ex experience this within our, own, within our own schooling. And when my husband met with a headmaster, he said, this happened to me almost you know, 30 years ago. I didn't know this was still happening. So it was, um, it was a really important time in the process and development of the legislation. And so um, I want to share that story. And I contextualize the paper that I wrote um, that I'm relaying to you today. Um, and it's, this, is part of that, um, this is part of that strand of ash that I'm theorizing about. It's stories and experiences like this that helped to weave uh, that legislation that Donna introduced to us. And um, I'm also working with two other pieces of legislation. The other one is the Squaw Bill, the state uh, mandate to eradicate offensive place names. Um, and that too, there are stories very similar to this. And many of us as Native people have those squaw stories when we were called a squaw. And um, that are also the strands of ash or the strands of policy story that make up these pieces of legislation. And so um, what, I, what I hope to also share with you is a transcendence beyond the multiculturalism. And um, Day and Caliste write about this, about the importance to transcend beyond um, the superfluous um, and move toward more the intrinsic like to get deeper into um, a real, and it's even beyond the leveling of a playing field, right? Anti-racism is a more critical and practical application of challenging the systemic racism and the ris racism in all of its forms. So, you know, I, I wanna share with you just that concept that there's something beyond multiculturalism that may transcend us further toward arriving at policies that address in effective ways the games like killing the Indians. Um, and so let me, let me jump around, uh, excuse me for jumping around here, but okay, so I wanna explain a little bit more about the title of the paper. Um, and I've done a little bit of that without weaving, um, weaving policy toward decolonization, but I haven't really talked about what decolonization means um, somewhere, s other places in the literature also engage with anti-colonialism, but it's really that process that engages with imperialism and colonialism at multiple levels. It's, for many of us, a space of hope that there's a way to undo um, the colonial legacy, and there's a way to address the colonial legacy. And so, in the work of an analyzing these laws, and the third law, by the way, that I am engaging with is a state law that recognizes our own, um, acknowledges the Wabanaki tribes to certify our own language teachers. So um, essentially, 
what that has done, or basically what that has done, is given the tribe, tribal schools authority to certify who is going to be teaching our language. So they, the, our people aren't having to go off reserve to go get a bachelor in education and compromise their language fluency and perhaps their knowledge, their Wabanaki knowledge fluency too. But um, it recognizes our people as already having that certification to teach um, and teach our own language. So therein, um, there are more policies and there's more text to that too, but I just wanted to share with you, these are the three policies that when I talk about weaving Wabanaki policy toward decolonization, it's like these are the three pieces of legislation. The legislation to mandate the LD-291, the legislation to mandate the teaching of history and culture, kindergarten through 12. That's the first piece of legislation. The second piece of legislation is the eradication of the state place names, the Squaw Bill. So the implementation of the Squaw Bill. And the third is the language, Wabanaki language um, teacher certification pro process that we have now that's legislated. <coughs> um, I, I've also already been using indigenous peoples, but it's sort of like um, indigenous peoples represent, Wilmer, Wilmer says in Linda DeHotway Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies, that indigenous peoples represent the unfinished business of decolonization. So when we sing this honor song and um, when we sing this honor song, in so many ways, it welcomes you to our territory. It, it, uh, indigenous peoples are indigenous, are from that territory. And um, it, also, it also honors and calls those ancestors. And you can feel that too. Like when you're in here, you can feel, you, I could really feel that. And a lot of us can feel that. And, um, and that I think is about, that is all about indigeneity, right? And those songs are, um, are ancient to this territory. Um, by the way, like as we're here by the ocean, I think it's also appropriate to share with you how these places came to be, right? So it's like here again, epistemology, it's like, it's very relevant, right? Um, so epistemology is like how things came to be, or epistemology helps us to understand how things came to be. So, um, it's, it's important to know that the coastal lands in Maine, um, let's see, how do I, okay. The coastal lands in Maine, the way that lands were allocated to people here were based on how many of those scalps were brought in, right? So the more of that, the more, you know, that's how the sort of the real estate market was run. And a lot of people don't know that. You know, those documents have been buried and hidden, but there's, so, you know, that is a knowledge and that is information. That's information that more of us need to be explaining when we have, you know, your ears. So it's, um, it's particularly appropriate to be welcoming you here to the space um, as Indigenous peoples. Um, okay. Um, this is the law, the, teach, the, the state mandate to teach Wabanaki history and culture. And so, and here are listed the teaching requirements. And we'll talk more about this at the colloquium this afternoon. Um, so, let me just jump around here for a moment. What I want to talk about is, um, is that epistemology, and I want to go back to epistemology. Um, because there's a new term in the literature, it's a new term to me in the literature that de Sousa Santos has written about in her text, Beyond Northern Epistemologies. And what, what she says and is the disruption of this way of being in the world. She calls it epistemicide. And so she specifically calls the academy to recognize these local knowledges, okay? Um, the knowledge that those ways of being in the world that the Wapanaki people engaged with, still engage with. You know, I would argue, and I believe that our epistemologies are still, we are still carry those epistemologies. 
And so um, what Santos is calling for, the academy to recognize these knowledges as equally valuable to traditional Western knowledge and identify such monoculture of scientific knowledge responsible for the epistemicide experienced by indigenous peoples. Now I'll explain, let me tell you a story about that to help to unpack this. Um, also my daughter, my husband and I will tell our children our creation stories and how we came to be. So part of that creation story is how we met, the birth story, but also the creation stories of our people about Gluskabe, about Iktumi. So Gluskabe is indigenous to Wabanaki peoples. And how Gluskabe came out of that ash, like Gluskabe pounded that ash and the people came out of that ash tree. And the Wabanaki epistemology will tell us that that's where our people come from, is that ash tree. And, um, and so that is, that tells us how we are in the world, right? And so the epistemicide would be connected to Henry Pratt's effort to kill the Indian and save the man. And um, killing the Indian and saving the man was the, edu the first era of educational policy that our people experienced. And that is with the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. And I'll show you, we'll talk more about this at the colloquium too, so I don't need to just sort of brush over this, but it's really significant. Um, Pratt was the headmaster of this school, and this was literally the policy. Now, this Carlisle school was the template for all residential schools in North America. And so, um, in, in Maine, what the research is telling us, Betsy Tanyan has done some research on this with Esther Adian for the coalition, uh, let me see this, um, the Indian Child Welfare Coalition. Um, and what they introduced to me is that in the list, Betsy compiled the list of all the Penobscots that went to the Carlisle Indian School. And, um, and what she found was that of all the main Indian tribes, our people, the Penobscots, went there in like triple the amount of times. And so this is what would happen when a person went to Carlisle School. This is Thomas Moore that was there before. And then they would cut their hair and not allow them, you know, punish them and discipline them for speaking the language. And they, this was saving, this was like killing the Indian and saving the man. So the man would look like this. This is not a man. This wasn't a man according to that policy. This is subhuman according to that policy. So what did that do to the way of being? What did that do to the epistemology of the people? And the ways of, no the ways of being and the ways of knowing. Um, it, it, it dramatically disrupted that. And um, the story that I want to share with you to help contextualize epistemicide is the following. And um, it's another story about parenting. My daughter came home from school and had said, Mama, they don't believe me. And this is first grade. Mama, they don't believe me that we come from a tree and a rock. And they laughed at me. And, um, and she said, and I said, well, where, you know, she said, well, there's, they are saying that, that people could come from, from monkeys. And uh, recently, I held, we held a seminar with some, with some Cree elders that have had very little contact with white society. And one of those Cree elders, and then we, we, we interfaced those older Cree elders with people, with elders that did go to residential school. And that old man that went to residential school, as he was listening to his Cree brothers speak about how we came to be, how we came to be in the world, s said to us, like in the circle, he started giggling. He said, thank God we don't come from monkeys. <laughs> said, and all this time, I knew we couldn't have come from monkeys. <laughs> and what the Cree people believe is that their bones, the, the bones, come from a particular tree. Like th there's different elements of their bodies that come from different elements of the earth. So, um, w you know, I share that I share this because it's, um, it's, very cr it's very current. Like Santos introducing this concept of epistemicide to us in the literature is an important one to engage with because it's like that physical genocide that I'm showing you, the atrocity 
that we have experienced and survived and that concept of I'm not supposed to be here and I'm also, it wasn't intended for me to think this way, you know, or to even look this way. Um, that epistemicide is underneath that layer. There's a lot of layering that's happened, so it's like peeling an orange and taking that layer, okay, we know that the physical genocide happened, the cultural genocide, and those are very interconnected. So it's like just genocide, right? And then within that is that epistemicide, the, the attempt to er eradicate our ways of being in the world. And that's what indigenous research methodology, which is ancient to us, but new to the academy is part of what Donna has done in donating what she's donated. So it makes space in the academy to engage uh, with indigenous ways of being and knowing. And um, with that, it's those, um, it's those experiences that move us toward decolonization, those anti-racist experiences that move us toward decolonization that is intrinsic to our survival. The hope of that and feeling and engaging with that hope is also intrinsic to that survival because we have been victimized by oppression, racism, and genocide, but we are not victims, right? And so it's like the, these, these events are critical. And when I say intrinsic, it's like the opposite of superfluous. It's like superfluous is, um, are these, you know, uh, let's see, superfluous is like the, just the real surface things that happen. Like what was happening in my daughter's school, they were teaching the kids like what we ate and how we danced, right? And which is important, because that's, that's a way of our being in the world too. But in, when I say something needs to happen that's more intrinsic, it's like this LD291 will get us at well, where, what, why is it that they don't engage with their creation story anymore? We haven't lost our language. We haven't lost our culture. These are things that have been stripped from us. Like I lose my keys. I don't lose my language. And so I think that role of understanding that is also intrinsic to our survival. So um, <coughs> yeah, I, share that, I share that concept of epistemicide to you because um, it's new to me, and when I heard it, and when I share it with my other colleagues, and I certainly accredit uh, Sousa Santos for introducing it to me, we're like, wow, that's so, you know, that's so amazing. And we've gotta, we've gotta start engaging with this a lot more. So um, with that, I just wanna close. Um, I wanna close by just giving you some main Indian truths. This is just some data that's been collected from the census 2000. These, this is more information that's important for us to know and to make folks aware of whenever we can. So that our unemployment rates right now, 16 and over, 4.7% 4 4 is the general population. Ours is 12.4%. Uh, that's almost triple um, rates of unemployment. Population living below the poverty line, our people are about almost, I don't know, three to four times more likely to be poor than white people. We are the least likely to be homeowners in our own homeland. I don't have this on here, but I'll just say that we are the least likely in this state to be homeowners in our homeland. Um, average life expectancy of Maine Indian peoples is 63, and for the general population is 77 years old. This is a legacy of the colonial experience. So this is a legacy of the, the genocide and the epistemicide, right? So um, they're very much connected. Oh, excuse me. Okay, what did I do here? Um, the next slide. The next slide talks about. Uh, the next slide. Where am I? Denise Altivator has done some work. With and she's working in sort of advocacy for. I don't know what. Uh, okay, I've got to click on this slide. And then I've got to go down here. Yeah, I don't know why it's coming up blank, but oops. Okay, I'll just read it, and I think you can sort of see, see the slide, no? Okay, the disproportionate incarceration rates. Oh, bugger. Okay. Um, 
right here. Okay. Oh, I see. I've got to get rid of this. Okay. Then shall I go to the big slide? No. Nope. Oh, wait. I know. There it is. <laughs> okay. So um, Denise Altivator has done some research. She works with um, Maine Indian prisoners in sort of an advocacy capacity. And um, she she was commissioned to do this Sabaic Criminal Justice Committee research um, by the Passamaquoddies um, and the state. And so what she has found is that 1.5% of total Mainers are incarcerated, right? And so 6% of Passamaquoddy people are incarcerated in the same system. Um, I share these truths with you because it's data that um, that is subjugated, it's hidden. We don't hear much about this. And then when we do hear it, um, it's often associated with terrible stereotypes about who we are. Um, and it's never linked to a legacy of our colonial experience. So, you know, I'm here to say this is totally linked to our colonial experience. And, um, and we need to be know, we need to be learn more about it. And I think that is the spirit of LB 291 the mandate to teach Wabanaki history and culture. Okay, I've, I've already gone 10 minutes over, and I haven't really talked much theoretically about the weaving and the sophistication of the mind, um, but I would like to share with you that that theoretical framework that I helped, I mean, that theoretical framework of taking ash and making baskets and that sophistication of the mind of the people to do it transcends the mechanics of just basket weaving, that it is an intellectual tradition that informs the basket making, which is the same intellectual tradition that I believe has woven the policies towards survival. And those strands are these policy stories. Those strands are the, is the blood memory, is what drives the legislation, is what drives the community organizing. And, um, and that's a real snap shot of it. But I will say, and I want to, talk about my mother's influence in helping me to unpack that and make sense of it. Because I knew that theoretically there was a space of engagement theoretically that I could make sense of the policy making, that I could draw on some academicians and some academic theory within the academy, but there was an intellectual tradition within our, within our own people that I needed to engage with. And I thank my mother's influence for helping me. We were sitting at my table and looking at a basket, and she said, well, and as I was talking and thinking, it was like she was just finishing what I was saying. And um, that is part of that indigenous research methodology. It isn't just about me and my research. It's about the people's support. The PhD is for everybody, right? And it's for, you know, it works toward heightening the awareness, like giving information like this and relaying it and unpacking it and making sense of it. So, um, you know, it's... My husband asked me one night, what do baskets and Gluskabi have to do with racism? Gluskabi is who opened that tree. And so um, my response to him was, I gotta think about that, right? And as I thought about it and thought about it, I thought racism and how it's embedded in our institutions makes it extremely difficult to teach our creation story, like what happened with my daughter, as a truth. It's more widely accepted as a myth so the systemic oppression prohibits the knowledge transfer and allows Western knowledge to be perpetuated and placed superior to indigenous knowledge, even if it's considered at all. So um, with that, uh, I'll just show you a couple more images. This, this is a first seal of Massachusetts. And the, the thing coming out of the guy's mouth says, come over and help us. And, you know, this is that colonial rhetoric that we're still hearing. Bush is say, was saying it, and it hasn't changed. 500 years, and that colonial rhetoric has not changed. You know, like education will, will save our children. And, um, and the type of education that has been going on, the schooling that has gone on, is where it needs to change dramatically and systemically. Um, anyhow, I, I want to share this, this ending. I'll conclude here with a story. This is a picture of my mom. And um, there was a wounded eagle that, um, that they found hopping around on one leg. And they brought it to the tribe. And they, the tribe worked with the state to heal this eagle. And <laughs> my mother had called me 
And she said, they asked me, because at the time my mother was, the, uh, was on council. She's now retired, tribal council. But she was the eldest on that council. And she said, they asked me to be the one to put this eagle out into the air for its first flight. And, uh, and she said, we joked, and she said, what if it just drops to the ground? <laughs> And, uh, and I said, well, you're going to have to let me know later. <laughs> and um, uh, my, my stepfather, uh, Jack Loftus, who worked for the Bangor Daily News for over 40 years and is a tremendous photographer, took these pictures. And, um, and as she's telling me, she called me later. And um, in, in between her calling me, my brother t called and said, Ma, drop the eagle. Can you believe it? And I thought, yeah, no, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so when I talked to my mother that night, um, she, as she told me the story about how that eagle just flew into the sky, I sat on the other line 3,500 miles away, 3,500 miles away, and I wept, and I felt hope, and I felt um, inspiration, and, um, and there's something very significant about that story to the research that I'm doing, um, you know, in that and that song, Red Sky. So there are things that are happening, although I, you know, when I say that we've been victimized um, and the victim, you know, we've, we have survived so much and there's so much to work, good work to be done. Um, and there is that, that eagle in flight. So um, that's why I talk about Red Hope because um, it's calling for the recognition of a Wabanaki intellectual tradition of basket making, weaving and policy making and our creation story, and honoring the mind. And Stephen Biko, who was a South African um, apartheid activist and a medical doctor, wrote a heavily cited text called I Write What I Like, and he died in prison. And what he write, what he's really famous for in, in saying is, is this, the greatest weapon in the eyes of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So I think that engaging with those Wabanaki intellectual traditions, those ways of being, are intrinsic to hope and survival and forward moving and thriving, not just surviving, but thriving, um, like the baby that you see here. So um, <coughs> with that, oh, and this is my girl. Again, another picture taken by her buffy. Um, and this is a, a, a graphic image that my nephew created um, and won a prize for, and in the middle, this is a t-shirt, in the middle, and I w this is a, this is, this tells me epistemicide's not complete, like we still have our ways of being, and he, yeah, I said, what is this, Lucas, Lucas um, Sock Beeson, he said, oh, well, that's a bunch of old people standing around um, a baby, he said, and that eagle is the ancestors flying over the people, and I, he's telling me this on the phone again. I'm crying. Thinking, wow, he knows this, right? So the way of being in the world, you know, this, the, it's been disrupted, but it has not been eradicated. Um, anyhow, I write. I just give you these websites as a as a resource uh, for the LD291. And thank you very much. I know I've gone terribly over time, but I, I apologize for that. Um, but this is couldn't be more important. Thank you very much. wondering where that document is located, the first one that you showed. Is it in the Massachusetts State Archives? Um, the bounty? Yes. The scalping bounty? Yes. I, don't, I know that we have it, certainly we have copies of the document. The original document, um, I don't know. I don't it know. Was who it I was related to Maine, right? Right, absolutely. It could, it could be in it's the Massachusetts. 18, it's 1857. Okay. It's an 1857 document. My committee has asked me the same question, and I've searched high and low. I don't know where the original is. I'll try to help you find um, it. Yeah. Thank you, Cal. Anyone else have any questions? Uh-oh. <laughs> since, since they're not going to invite me up to say anything, I can see. <laughs> I want to say that I couldn't have picked a better person for the first lecture. You did very, very uh, well, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy.
Um, so I want to say thanks to you for coming, and um, I'm really glad you showed us that document and some of the statistics that you showed us and some of the photos that you showed us are really incredible. Um, you know, one thing, there was a talk in this room yesterday. Was anyone here in the talk yesterday about science and science in the schools? Yeah, so it was, I really wish that your talk had been right before that talk instead of right after that talk. It was this very nice man, the scientist working for the state of Arizona. He's worked with a few members of Obama's cabinet. And he was talking about um, education in the schools, the way they teach science in particular, and uh, you know the terrible threat of uh, intelligent design in particular, and this idea that some students aren't going to learn evolutionary theory, and this is a huge problem, and we have to stop these Christians in Kansas who don't want to learn evolutionary theory. And it became a very well-meaning sort of pep rally for science and Science had found the answers, and darn it, kids better learn them or it's going to be a problem. And anyway, it's, the pep rally disturbed me slightly, and I tried to suggest to them that, you know, science has found a particular set of answers. Those set of answers have been useful in certain ways, very troubling in many other ways. There were a lot of scientists involved in the Native American genocide. Scientists built nuclear weapons. Scientists have been involved in all this stuff. I got the sense in that room how difficult it must be to articulate a different perspective, to defend that perspective, to come up with creative ways to argue that that perspective should be taught in the schools. And I was trying to articulate it a little bit yesterday. I didn't do a good job. You did this incredible job with it today. And anyway, I just want to thank you. I think it must be incredibly hard work to continue to defend these different ways of thinking these different perspectives against this monoculture of knowledge, mm -hmm. particularly, you know, this idea that scientists have found the answers, other answers, <laughs> different ideas about where we came from are wrong. So anyway, I admire that you've taken it on, yeah. and uh, so thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. I would just love to hear a little bit about um, the really practical ways that you envision things being taught in the schools, like what exactly happening and the designing of the curriculum and, and the getting toward deeper meaning along with, you know, the basic facts of history and, mm -hmm. and the stories that go with it. You know, how would this really be transmitted to the students in mm -hmm. a way that they take it with them, you know, as a something just uh, along with everything else that they're learning in their body of mm -hmm. knowledge. I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think that it's, I think, I know that from what I, my belief and understanding at this point is that it can't be compartmentalized and there's not a recipe to say, here it is. I mean, we have some templates, some curricular templates. You can find those on the website, right? And we've had um, several awesome Wabanaki teachers that have designed these. Julia Sock Beeson, James, well, James, Fra James Francis is a historian, Molly and Dana, uh, Leanne Francis. We have, they have done a tremendous amount of work to design the curriculum, right? Uh, it's yet, and that might be part of that recipe, but it's not, it's sort of like knowledge. It's, you can't really, it's, I think it's problematic to sort of box it and compartmentalize it. I think that pedagogically there is, um, it has more to do with the pedagogy of how and the, the policy-wise, policy will inform the pedagogy. And I think that right now it's sort of like, um, we are generally in education, we're trained to manage a classroom, right? And with no child left behind, that was exacerbated. You know, the management of classrooms increased significantly, right? And so I think as colleges of education, um, if we're really going to engage with this pedagogically, if we're going to engage with the pedagogy of emancipation and liberation and decolonization 
then it requires even it requires the work of teachers to transform those institutions because to prioritize this goes against the probably the policies of the school it goes against the expectations of you as a teacher it um, you aren't evaluated for how much of this you teach right and I think that you know, I firmly believe that systemically and individually there is agency like everyone has like teachers have agency to create social and political change and I think that that's that engagement with those pedagogies of liberation, emancipation, decolonization, and how is that manifested? So what does that look like, Rebecca? Like, enough of that, how does that look like? What that looks like is, um, is what I talked about earlier. It's like that elder in my study that says, you know those, it's only Indian people that are really gonna care about Indian people. You wouldn't see any of that legislation if Indian people weren't driving that thing, right? And so, Conversely, I do believe that everyone has agency. And I think that it takes an, a decolonizing autobiography. Cecilia Haig Brown writes about this, this decolonizing autobiography. It takes an, an engagement on your part as a teacher or as a professor to ask, what is, my, what is my relationship to the land I'm on right now? How do I benefit from the colonial experience of Native people, right? And uh, that's a big one. How do I benefit from the colonial experience of Native people? Because that gets us closer to that, that concept of Indians care about Indians. Indians are gonna do for Indians. Well, allies will do for Indian people. And that's, I think, part of that red hope, is that people do have agency. You know, there is, uh, but it's like there's certain things to do to move toward engaging with agency in a real meaningful, effective way. And I think that's rooted in how you teach in that pedagogy. Everyone remembers their awesome kindergarten teacher. You know, she, typically she taught with so much love and respect and honor. And then it's like that kindergarten to first grade shift. Like even like when we're trained as teachers, You've got to you've got to heighten your management of the classroom. You need to make sure that they have those outcomes, those state outcomes. They know this, that, right? And I think that um, I hear my supervisor, my doctoral supervi supervisor, Dr. Uh, Weber Pilwax. She'll tell people and teachers that ask the same question in a different context. You know that she's not talking about LD 291. Unfortunately, in Alberta, there's nothing like this. In Alberta, there's not there's nowhere near a mandate to teach about. Um, Alberta Native people, but what she will tell teachers is, you know, you've got to love these children, and you've got to have a commitment to these issues, and I think that pedagogically, that is where the emancipation is, the decolonization is. Um, so, like the, um, let me see, the mechanics of what you're asking can be found within the LD291 website. You can find the curriculum, and it's been designed so that you can incorporate it in what you're doing, but what I think I'm, what I believe I'm calling for is like a transcendence beyond that, you know, it's, um, which is, which is a, a lot of hard work, right? I hope that I made sense in, in answering that. Yeah, there, ha there has been, there has been, and it's actually not posted on LD291 because it's, um, it's a feeling of the people that are designing the curriculum that maybe going that young isn't appropriate. Um, but I would say, I think differently, and, um, and I, I don't think I'm the majority voice on this, but I will share with you that if the children are playing these games, they have the, cr children have really awesome critical thinking abilities. And so um, we teach Anne Frank's diary beginning in third, sixth grade. You know, children are reading Anne Frank's diary. Mostly, I mean, I, I spoke to a group of social, um, social studies teachers. May, it was a main social studies conference and there were a lot of social studies teachers in that room. It was maybe triple, quadruple the amount of people in this room and I asked them, how many of you are teaching Anne Frank's diary? And the overwhelming majority raised their hand. 
So, um, and what I gleaned from them thereafter was that, <coughs> you know, typically it's taught, some teach it as early as third grade, a lot of kids don't have their reading ability, so they'll read, they start reading it in sixth grade. And um, so children have the ability to be engaging with this quite early on, and unfortunately, we don't have Anne Frank's diary yet, you know, but um, there are curricular resources that can address this, and it's, there are, there are curricular resources within the Oyate, the second, um, this one here, within that uh, website that will engage with, um, you know, sort of s some sort of, um, there are good resources on that one, now as I'm thinking more about it. And it does, um, there's another text that's called um, Rethinking Columbus, and it's a teacher's guide. It's called Rethinking Columbus. And there are some really great curricular resources. That text is listed in the LD291 um, text resource list. That one looks at that bounty. There's a copy of that bounty in that text. And it gives teachers ideas of how to talk and work with that. And um, because we'd rather be teaching, I would, I'd rather have a teacher teaching my child about um, the genocide we've survived than having to respond to them playing kill the Indians at recess, right? So they have an ability to know that. And when I went in to talk to my daughter's classroom, I explained, uh, and the teacher was very nervous, you know, that I would go in and just be angry. And well, I was, I was enraged and I was saddened. And, um, but I, th I think she worried that I would act that out on the children, which was certainly not the case. And uh, we circled up, and I explained that at one time that was a for real game, you know. And today it's it's like it really hurts us, and it's really painful to know that, you know, that you were playing that that children here. I didn't say you. I never said you. I was really conscious about that, but I said that children here at the school were playing that game and celebrating that because at one time it was for real. So uh, there are ways, right, to do it. And um, anyhow, that are more. Uh, preventative than prescriptive, right? Or vice versa. I think one of the challenges is, that as you've pointed out, there's a lot of resources about uh, the teaching about Native Americans. Mm -hmm. But the challenge that we all face in teacher education is how do we open the minds and souls of teachers and administrators to really uh, examine their thoughts, their thinking, their behavior, because it's so easy to compartmentalize any kind of multicultural education. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King, we devote it to one day and then forget about yeah, the rest of the right. year. So, and there's always too much to teach and too little time. Mm -hmm. So over time, somehow it has to be in the, in the interim run, it has to be changing the teachers themselves. Yeah. I agree. And right now, there isn't one university or college in Maine that teaches, uh, that, is, that has a compulsory course with these issues. There's not one college or university that has a compulsory course to learn about this, but we have a law that mandates the teaching of Wabanaki history and culture kindergarten through 12. So our colleges of education are failing our students, our, our, our pre-service teachers, because they're not getting what they're supposed to be doing, right? And so um, this work is also a call to um, and an urge to make a course that's compulsory, because the reality is, it's like making the LD-291. We had to do that because it's like getting back to what that elder says. It's only Indian people that are really going to care about Indian people. People weren't going to so all of a sudden start teaching this. A law had to be made. And so, um, yeah, I think that I, I totally agree. I think that's a really important statement that you just relayed. It's about the teacher, and it's about agency, that agency um, to create the, the, abil the ability to see that you can create social and political change. Because working in an education system and being overschooled, um, I think is a really and it's 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 a it's an overarching problem, right? S 
So, Rebecca, if we have all of these programs about multiculturalism, as they do, my sister is a pre-kindergarten teacher in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. lots of programs on multiculturalism, and you're saying multiculturalism isn't enough because it's superfluous. Mm -hmm. Is that not, does that not sort of function as a way to, um, uh, to a pathway to increase the kinds of theories that you're talking about? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I I didn't say that multiculturalism doesn't work or isn't the way. In fact, the spirit of multiculturalism, I believe, is not, the intention of multiculturalism is, has not been fulfilled. So that Elaine Penderhues, um, she's a, she is um, a black elder professor emeritus out of Boston College who wrote Race, Power, Understanding Race, Power, and Class. And um, she has an incredible mind around this. And she was one of the first writers about multiculturalism. And as we read anti-racism today, it's more in alignment with what she was saying about multiculturalism. But how it's been, uh, how it's been real, how it's been acted out, the way multiculturalism is often acted out, it's, um, it's often tokenized, it's often superfluous, in institutions, um, and it is not intrinsic to institutions. And multiculturalism and indigenous issues, um, it's like they need to be far more intrinsic to institutions. And um, Elaine Penderhues, who is cited as one of the founders of multiculturalism, which she doesn't self-identify as that at all, um, but she's one of the older ones um, today um, will say and you know has said to me and said publicly that the way that it's been acted out has not necessarily been you know it's like we think of oftentimes if you ask a mainstream person you know what is you know is uh, oftentimes uh, well as let me see as racially and underrepresented people it's frustrating how like the we went through waves of it too it's sort of like tolerance you all remember the tolerance era of diversity and multiculturalism? And people still engage with that. And it's like, to you're going to tolerate me? You know? So, um, and I think that there's a transcendence to multiculturalism in anti racism. I think that there's a transcendence in, anti in indigenous research methodology to even anti racist methodology. So, um, yeah, I think it is a pathway, but sometimes it's like that concept of cultural competency. It's like, okay, now that I'm culturally competent, I don't need to bother with that anymore. And I've got a real problem with cultural competency, the way it's been acted out. And at one time, you know, we had hope for it, like thinking, okay, this is something that we can, that will, you know, help people to be more responsible. But it's really, you know what, it's that decolonizing autobiography that I feel hope in, that one that Cecilia Haig Brown has introduced to us. She does it in, in her class and works with her students. And remember those questions are, and do in writing that decolonizing autobiography, what is my role? Like, what is my relationship to the territory I'm on right now? And how do I benefit from the colonial experience of Native people? You know, it's, um, I think those are spaces of transcendence, you know, and anyhow, I, I hope that answers it. Glad you asked that question, because I have another answer. Uh, when I first was going to uh, introduce the bill to the legislature, um, there was in, uh, a representative who had tried to put a multicultural bill through many times. And she came up to me and she said, you know, Donna, it, this isn't going to work. Your bill, you know, you're just saying native, name natives, and they're not, in, you know, they're not even allowing multi multicultural bill through. And what I find, or what I found, was when you go to multiculturalism, and when I talk to people in other states, that bills have gone through on multiculturalism, they tend to homogenize everything. And that if you want to sp be specific about the first nations of this country, 
then it's very easy for those First Nations to be homogenized and to become marginalized through that. Now, I'm not saying anything against teaching multiculturalism because I, I think that it should be taught. But I think that the fact that we're the First Nations of this country and we, this is our land, everybody's on our land, and it was built on the bodies of our people. I think that is the significant difference. And, uh, and as well in the um, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, Native values, and I don't know a lot about this, but I do know that there is documentation for the fact that Native principles were included in the construction of the Constitution. So why, don't, why isn't that being taught would be one question. 